is the National. Facebook says it is taking aim at its fake news problem. Will its fix hit the mark? Plus, late night phone calls from Canada and Mexico change Donald Trump's mind. I like them very much. I respect their countries very much. But will his NAFTA pirouette last long? And so much for a dragon's den on Parliament Hill. He's out. But what does it do to the race? Andrew, Chantel, and Althea on that and more. And what would Thursday be without Rex? He's here too. What started in 2004 as a place for Harvard students to gather online has ballooned into an online world where nearly two billion of us live together. See something presented as fact on Facebook and you can bet a lot of people believe it, even if it's unbelievable. Today, the company acknowledged the subtle and insidious ways that misinformation is spreading in many countries and outlined how it's fighting back. But as senior correspondent Adrian Arsenault explains, in some places the truth is too expensive to find. Pressure on Facebook to do something started building after a U.S. election dripping in fake news. The social media behemoth was initially defensive. Mark Zuckerberg calling 99% of Facebook content authentic. The idea that uh, you know fake news on Facebook, uh, of which you know it's a it's a very small amount of of, um, of the content. Uh, influence the, the election in any way, I think, is a, a pretty crazy idea. Facebook has become more serious about this. It just removed 30,000 fake accounts in election mode France. And fake news detection tools have just been deployed in France too, as well as Germany, Norway and the United States. Today, a broader plan was released, including teaching users how to spot fake news, a plan to stop groups from profiting from fake news and devising new tools to curb the spread of it. It all sounds good, but murky. There's about 1.9 billion people logging in every month around the world. And if you think about how much content they share and how much stuff they interact with, it's, I think, actually humanly impossible for them to monitor everything and be on top of what's happening on their platform. So to know when misinformation is spreading and to have a real handle on that is difficult. Uh, and so they're trying a bunch of things, some of them really technical, some of them more uh, human labor oriented. Globally, fake news has become like a crime of opportunity, climbing in any open window. Facebook inadvertently opened that window. Look what happens in certain regions where mobile internet is slow and expensive. In these countries, Facebook makes access to its platform free. No need to pay for data on your phone to use it. It's a hugely popular move in places like the Philippines. But there are consequences. Fake news stories from fake sites end up polluting Facebook feeds, and not everyone can tell the difference. Are they both real? Are they both fake? I think... They're both fake. It's real or it's Yeah, fake? it is. Delimit. About the limit is. When fact-checking means clicking on links or going to other sites, that eats up precious, pricey data, and some don't bother. What do you think this does to your democracy, all this fake news? They can manipulate the minds of the people into believing something that is not real. Do you think that's happening now? Yes. One Philippine senator who was the target of fake stories wrote to Facebook pleading for help stopping the spread. Another is hosting Senate hearings into the fake news phenomenon there, hoping for real action, hoping today's announcement is just a beginning. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, Toronto. Another trend on social media, a disturbing one, is the posting of videos showing people carrying out violent crimes. The one of 19-year-old Serena McKay being beaten before her body was found on Sunday was on Facebook for hours yesterday. Tonight, the small Manitoba community of Seguin First Nation held a vigil for McKay. Cameron McIntosh is there. Cameron. Oh, Peter, it's a cold, gray evening here in Saiging and a somber one, too. Behind me, there's a sacred fire burning. Beyond that, in that roundhouse building, the vigil is continuing. People have been coming and going all night, and many plan to stay well past dark. 
Really, tonight, a lot of emotions are being expressed. A lot of sorrow over a life loss and the fact that the two accused are teenage girls from this community, which in itself is very sensitive to the issue of murdered Indigenous women. Also, a lot of anger over that video. Questions like, if someone could shoot that video, why didn't they stop the attack? And why did that video get on to Facebook? Many people here have seen it and are horrified by it. But also there's a very strong sense here that this could be a turning point for the community, a chance to really look at the challenges that are facing many youth in this community, including a lack of opportunity and drug addiction. We spoke with one of the organizers of this vigil tonight, an elder in this community. She actually found the dead girl's body on Sunday morning. She talked about the need for the youth to take this moment and go forward. We just had a round circle this morning at the arbor behind me and uh, we got some ideas from the youth. So I'm hoping that the one thing this death did do was to trigger the healing that Saging actually needs from the youth themselves. And Peter, those two uh, young people accused in this, of course, are both uh, females, one age 16, one age 17. Both have been charged with second degree murder. Cameron, what can you tell us about the investigation? Well, police are saying that that video is definitely a part of the investigation. They haven't confirmed that they have authenticated it, but they're looking at it very closely, say more charges could result because of it. As for the video, Facebook itself is saying that it is removing it. It's popped up a few times. It will remove it whenever it, there's a complaint or whenever uh, its algorithm picks it up. So Facebook says it's managing the situation now too. Community leadership is asking anyone that has had a had it pop up on their Facebook uh, feed or in their Facebook Messenger to delete it. Also, a very interesting point made by the RCMP today, while social media has been part of the issue here in this investigation, it's also helped the investigation. They say when that video hit Messenger, so many people from Saging messaged it directly to the RCMP that it's been a big help to the investigation. All right, Cameron, thank you. That's Cameron McIntosh of the Saging First Nation in Manitoba. When some Canadians can't get a mortgage from a bank, they go to a lender. But one of Canada's biggest lenders is in trouble. Home Capital Group is trying to prove it's still good for business, even as some investors pull their money out and the stock takes a beating. Rene Filipponi has more. Five years ago, it was all smiles. Home Capital Group was cashing in on the growing demand for mortgages as the Canadian market heated up. Today, a very different story. The company now in need of a lifeline, securing a $2 billion line of credit, money it needs to mitigate the impact of a decline in its savings as depositors pull their money out. All lenders, whether they're the big banks or a bank like Home Bank, they access funds when uh, families make deposits in their bank, and then they take that money and they lend it out um, through residential mortgages. The company has lost nearly $600 million from savings accounts in recent weeks and expects it to get worse. This expert says trouble for the company started a couple of years back when there were questions raised about who was getting approved for mortgages. There was a problem that brokers were exaggerating or actually doing outright fraud in terms of reporting their incomes of the potential borrowers. Brokers were fired at the company, but new allegations this week hit home capital stock price hard. Ontario regulators claim the company misled its shareholders and failed to satisfy disclosure obligations. The company denies this. And I think, frankly, it's a wake-up call for this crazy housing market. Mark Cahodes made a name for himself, betting against the U.S. housing market before the crash of 2008, making money from its failure. He's trying to do the same with home capital and is a critic of alternative lenders. These guys are a blight on the system. I always say not everyone should be a parent, not everyone can afford a house. Other market watchers point out the company had low default rates, but say this will be hard to come back from because trust has been broken. The reality is that's what's happened. There's a lack of trust in management, a lack of trust in their products, and so everybody's exiting very quickly. For anyone with a home capital mortgage, experts say keep making your payments. If the company fails, those mortgages will likely be bought by other banks or lenders. And if home capital can't survive, the biggest impact could be fewer options other than the big banks for Canadians looking to own a home. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Toronto.
Three liberal governments tabled budgets today in Canada. Here are a few highlights, starting with Ontario, where a booming economy tilted revenues in its favour. This fiscal year will have a deficit, but the next three are projected to be balanced. A few notable measures focus on young people. The biggest is free prescription drugs for anyone under 25. As well, graduates only have to start repaying their student loans when they start earning $35,000 a year. Nova Scotia's Liberals also showed off a balanced budget projecting a surplus for next year. Basic personal amounts will go up, lowering taxes for half a million people. Years of austerity mean this budget allows for more spending on health care and education programs. The new Liberal government in Yukon is also in the black, but not for long. It projected a surplus of $6.5 million this year, but the next three years will have double-digit deficits. The flurry of panic over Donald Trump's threat to sign an executive order to kill NAFTA is over, at least for now. That latest volley especially short-lived. While all this back and forth may be what the businessman in Trump believes is the way to get the U.S. the best new deal on trade, observers on both sides of the border are warning him that his words matter. Paul Hunter explains. So was it just a bluff or a bona fide threat? Well, I was going to terminate NAFTA as of two or three days from now. But as you might have heard, Donald Trump changed his mind. Remember that meeting with Justin Trudeau in February? Turns out these things have an effect. Says Trump now, his view of Trudeau and of Mexico's president played into why he now says he will not tear up the North American Free Trade Agreement. This after two phone calls yesterday. I like both of these gentlemen very much. They called me and they said, rather than terminating NAFTA, could you please renegotiate? NAFTA, here getting initialed in 92, governs hundreds of billions of dollars in North American trade every year. But trade disputes have a long history on this continent regardless, both before NAFTA. The potato growers set up their barricade at this major border crossing. After NAFTA. We cannot haul a bushel to Canada. They won't let us through. I mean, to me, that's not free trade. And over lumber and dairy products. Canada, what they've done to our dairy farm workers is a disgrace. We had a good conversation last night. Trudeau's goal in that phone call was to convince Trump that updating NAFTA is way smarter than flat out killing it. We agreed that we could sit down and get to work on looking at ways to improve NAFTA uh, as it's been improved before uh, in, in a thoughtful way that will be to the benefit of, uh, of, of all our countries. And though Trump agreed, all this talk of changing the rules on trade is already having its own effect. Increasingly, when I talk to our members, what they're saying is we're holding back on our investments until we know what the rules of the game are going to be. And keep in mind, though Trump has backed off, it may well be only for now. If I'm unable to make a fair deal for the United States, meaning a fair deal for our workers and our companies, I will terminate NAFTA. But would he? Could he? Or is it all just a ploy to be the tough-talking negotiator driving a better deal? Trump's brand. For the record, says Trump, he's going to give renegotiating NAFTA, in his words, a good, strong shot. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. There's another theory about what Trump was up to with his threats yesterday, coming from the people around Justin Trudeau. David Cochran has heard some of what's being said. David. Well, you know, Peter, there's a sense among senior government officials here in Ottawa that Canada and Mexico were not the targets of this latest trade th threat. In fact, they believe it was directed more at the U.S. Congress. The 100 days in office mark is fast approaching, and Trump has struggled to make good on a lot of his election promises. And Canadian officials I spoke with believe that this was really designed to hammer congressmen and senators whose states rely on cross-border trade in an attempt to force them to cooperate more fully with the White House. Now, when they spoke yesterday, Trudeau 
Trudeau told Trump he understood his frustration with Congress. At one point, he even expressed some relief that he doesn't have to deal with that kind of system here in Canada. But that's also when Trudeau cautioned the president that acting on that frustration could hurt a lot of regular, ordinary people. So the prime minister plans to continue this patient diplomatic approach, but I've also been told that the prime minister's office likes what it hears from people like British Columbia Premier Christy Clark, who is loudly demanding retaliation over softwood lumber tariffs, specifically aiming at the U.S. coal industry. They feel this gives them a bad cop to go along with Justin Trudeau's good cop. And Peter Ottawa is also going to try to use indirect methods to get his message to the U.S. president. We all know Donald Trump watches a lot of cable news. They want to get senior ministers on the U.S. networks as much as possible. One specific goal, I'm told, is to get Foreign Affairs Minister Christian Freeland on Fox News, which is Trump's favorite channel. And Peter, if that happens, we might be able to get the president's reaction in real time on Twitter. All right. David, thank you. Well, it was meant to streamline, make everything more efficient, but any money saved from implementing the Phoenix Pay Program is now being spent on fixing all the problems. The government has now put five top cabinet ministers on a task force to fix it, even as it publicly declares that the system is working fine. As Katie Simpson tells us, for people with mortgages and bills piling up, none of that really matters. Checking the mail gives Stephen Buell a daily dose of disappointment. The retired public servant says he's waiting for more than $50,000 in severance pay that was supposed to arrive a year ago. It's just been stuck in limbo. There's, there's no, I can't make any big decisions. Buell retired after his wife, Jacqueline, died. Getting caught in the government's pay system fiasco has only added to his troubles. It's not great but I try to keep smiling. Today, Ottawa announced a strategy to solve these kinds of issues, which stem from its problematic payroll program called Phoenix. The new plan includes tapping Ralph Goodale, the most senior member of cabinet, to lead a task force on the system. I mean, I would have liked this committee a year ago, but suffice it to say, it's, it's here now. Over the next two years, Ottawa will also reallocate the $140 million in savings the Phoenix program was supposed to generate to cover costs related to solving pay problems. I'm beginning to think this is going to be part of maybe uh, the Liberals' election campaign of 2019. We will fix Phoenix. I mean, it's dragging on and on. Tens of thousands of public servants have been underpaid, overpaid, or not paid at all since Phoenix was rolled out in February of 2016. But is there a prediction as to when this will work? Well, the, the system works. 300,000 more than that public servants get paid every two weeks. But not all of them are being paid properly. The Liberals have long blamed the previous Conservative government for laying off 700 staffers during the planning stages of Phoenix. But for those caught in the mess, that's not what the immediate focus should be. Please fix it as soon as possible. Ottawa has no timeline on a solution, but it's also offering cash payouts to workers who had trouble filing their taxes. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. The Ethics Commissioner has concluded Justin Trudeau did not contravene the Conflict of Interest Act with two private fundraisers last year. The opposition called them cash for access events. Mary Dawson says she did have concerns about potential interactions between the Prime Minister and some of the participants, but that after investigating she found no rules were broken. The woman who held the attention of millions yesterday morning by swinging from a platform on a construction crane is out of jail tonight. Marissa Lazo was released on conditions she stay out of construction sites and off of rooftops. She faces six mischief charges for this. Rescue workers spent four hours trying to get her down as people around the world watched. Though Lazo did not say anything to reporters, her friends describe her as a thrill seeker who has done this kind of thing before. United Airlines has settled a lawsuit brought by a passenger who was dragged off one of its planes. Cell phone video of Dr. David Dow's treatment became an international sensation. The terms of the settlement were not made public. Hours before that, the airline said it will now offer up to $10,000 to passengers who give up their seats on oversold flights. Coming up right after the break. Why some private sponsors are still waiting for their Syrian family. Plus, Margaret Atwood's sudden spike in popularity. 
things aligned in a way that had nothing to do with me planning them. That's still ahead on The National. Nationalist protesters storm Macedonia's parliament today. They attacked the Social Democratic leader after his party and others chose an ethnic Albanian as parliamentary speaker. Macedonia has been in political crisis since 2015, when a scandal brought down the ruling government. Tonight, the president called for calm and invited leaders of all parties to meet tomorrow. And these are purportedly explosions near Damascus Airport. Syria says Israel hit a military installation today. Israel says its missile defense system shot down an incoming projectile from across the border. Recently, the Israeli military has struck inside Syria, targeting weapons shipments to Hezbollah from Iran. Canada's response to the Syrian refugee crisis has been praised for its speed and efficiency. But tonight, one of thousands of private sponsors wants to go public about how long it's taken to get a family here and how much money has been wasted while waiting. Rosa Marcatelli has more. Canada! Canada! Oh my gosh, there we are! This moment should have happened months ago. Instead, it took more than a year to get here. Let's go meet our family, guys. We've been asked not to show the parents' faces over concerns for families still in Syria. Welcome to Canada. These are some of the members of the sponsorship group. They were one of the first in the country to privately sponsor a family from Syria. That was in late 2015. Just last month, the family finally arrived. And it was just all very frustrating to be in this communications black hole. Big seating area for the family. The sponsors did everything they had to. They raised a lot of money, rented an apartment for the family of seven at $1,500 a month. Then they waited. It's like the total lack of answers. 
All they knew was that Canadian authorities told the family it would soon be in Canada. That was more than a year ago. Go Public first spoke with the sponsors in December. And I can't even imagine what it's like for this family living in limbo. Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada tells us the application was held up over routine security checks for the father, blaming what it calls security partners for the very long delay. Then, just weeks after Go Public started asking questions, things started moving again. Uh, the word security is just a giant black box out of which we get no answers. This family waited a year. Is that reasonable in your mind? No, it's not reasonable at all. He says the issue is not security checks, but staffing. Well, what happened is that the government said it wanted to bring in 25,000 Syrian refugees, and they did it through an extraordinary processing system where they brought in lots of staff and, you know, but then after that, it all collapsed. Go Public found staff was drastically cut after the government sponsorship program ended. At one point, Canada had about 500 officials working on the Syrian resettlement initiative. Now the government tells us more than 70 staff are working on claims. I want them to know that this is Canada and they are welcome. Sorry, emotional. I knew that would happen. <laughs> 180 sponsorship groups have now been waiting more than a year for Syrian refugees to arrive. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Toronto. And there's lots more to come on tonight's program, including a pop culture surge for Margaret Atwood. I don't feel as dire as some people do because I'm old. Mm. <laughs> Plus, O'Leary quits the race and Trump threatens Canada. Quite the week. The country's most watched political panel is just minutes away, and so is Rex. That's next on The National. Here's a look at the day's business numbers. The TSX dropped 143 points. The dollar fell slightly. In New York, the Dow gained six points. The price of oil went down 65 cents a barrel. Showing off some skin has moved from the TV screens to the streets and now to the schools. It's a hot day. It's very it's hot. It's a hot day. Too hot for some anxious principals. You know, it was causing a distraction, there's no question. She sent home this note. Keep the underwear hidden. No exposed boxer shorts, no wayward bra straps. I think that we're perverted, like, like some guy will go, Whoa. From the archives of CBC News. If a girl should know how to dress to school, I think it's up to them, really. In tight sweaters, while they're not very good, I don't think. I'd rather see a girl wearing blouses and stuff like that. Do you enjoy wearing mini skirts? Yeah. Well, I don't really prefer them on girls, but also I think it's just that it, it modernizes the way the girls dress. The skirt rises up when you sit down, so you have to put your books something on your knees or something to hold it down. I just don't like the idea of them wearing way up here. It looks, you know, it looks, it's not, not right. That was Barbara Emil getting the long and short of the miniskirt story. School's back all over the country now. Did today's back to schoolers reject the dictates of the department stores? Here on What's New, we took a look at how kids actually went back to school this fall and what we saw were students like these. You can read a book in chains, you can go to school in chains, you can roll down a hill in chains, you can do whatever you want in chains. In the late 60s, there was pressure on the schools to relax dress codes. Shorter skirts, pants for girls, and eventually jeans were allowed for everybody. The freedom that the children have known for the past 15 years has been just a little bit too much. The parents have decided to adopt a uniform this year. They do seem to be more serious. And we work harder because we look, uh, look better. Teachers don't really know whether uniforms make any difference to the children's schoolwork, but both teachers and parents hope the uniform is here to stay. I guess I was brought up different than most kids. I just don't believe in wearing stuff that vulgar, as my mother calls it. A piece of film was supposed to have been cut to open this year's Festival of Festivals, but the organizers couldn't find any, so an old-fashioned ribbon was used instead. This evening, the gala premiere belongs to a Canadian film, Ticket to Heaven. A number of limousines have pulled up with well-dressed people, and fortunately, nobody seems to know who they are. Despite the problems, after the film, it was party time, and there was everything you'd expect at a showbiz bash. Stars, Booze, good looking women, good looking men, people dancing to the music of Martha and the Muffins, 
and more booze. It's Warren Beatty night at the Festival of Festivals, where the spotlight shines on everyone. The ushers at the theater had their hands full. It was their job to make sure the fans and the stars didn't collide. But when the big black Continental pulled up to the curb, there was no stopping the autograph hounds. I'm very proud of myself from restraining myself from attempting to wrestle him to the ground because it's exactly what I wanted to do. This was opening night, a gala for the North American premiere of Joshua Then and Now. There were Klieg lights and limousines, but there were also some charming down-home touches. The star, James Woods, arrived with his proud parents, who came in from Rhode Island for the event. Now the oh-so-cool set have decreed Canada's little festival that could a must. <laughs> That, of course, is Robin Williams, Claudia Schiffer. It's the only film festival in the world where you see all of the most important films. You see a whole year come in advance. As un-Canadian as it is to gloat, movie critic Roger Ebert says go right ahead. Yeah, it's okay, Canada. It's okay. It's a real big, real good festival. to start. O'Leary, Trump, which reality TV star gets top billing this week? Let's first do Trump and his strange journey of bashing NAFTA and Canada and then reversing himself all in a matter of hours. Chantel's in Montreal tonight. Andrew and Althea are here in Toronto. Tonight's panel is really about kind of believability, what to believe, who to believe. We all believe the U3, so you're going to make sense of all this for us. Let's watch Trump from today on his sudden belief that they can go ahead and try to renegotiate NAFTA. Watch this. I was going to terminate NAFTA as of two or three days from now. Uh, the president of Mexico, who I have a very, very good relationship, called me. And also the prime minister of Canada, who I have a very good relationship, and I like both of these gentlemen very much, they called me. And they said, rather than terminating NAFTA, could you please renegotiate? Uh, I like them very much. I respect their countries very much. Uh, the relationship is very special. And I said, I will hold on the termination. Let's see if we can make it a fair deal. Because NAFTA has been a horrible deal for the United States. It's been very good for Canada. It's been very good for Mexico. But it's been horrible for the United States. And if you check my campaign, any of my speeches, I said, I'll either renegotiate or I'll terminate. All right, what do we make of that? Andrew. Well, there's any number of possible explanations. One is that this is a uh, bargaining tactic to get leverage, to make us come to the table. One is that the, that the, the leak of that um, uh, executive order was the Steve Bannon, Peter Navarro faction, the economic nationalists within the White House, leaking it to force Trump's hand. Um, he changes his mind from day to day. It's entirely possible he might have thought one thing on one day, one thing the next day. This is a guy who's entirely unbound by anything that would normally bound somebody in his, in his uh, position. Not custom, not precedent, not law, not uh, uh, expert consensus, not what his previous statements have been. He's entirely unpredictable. I think we're learning this every day about him, and this is yet another example. Uh, if it wasn't uh, a challenge for our government trying to figure out how to deal with them before, uh, we're seeing what a challenge it is now. Chantal? Remember, this is the same person who talked about tweaking uh, mm -hmm. the relationship. When was that? In February? Oh, boy. Um, we, we do tend to, and that's normal, focus a lot on uh, our prime minister, Mexico. There are uh, internal forces at work, not only in the White House, but in the United States. And that, that trial balloon about terminating NAFTA uh, did trigger reactions inside the United States, in Congress, uh, within the Republican Party. So uh, yes, it's nice to say that uh, we called them up, uh, him up and he changed his mind, but I suspect that there was pushback from inside. And this is a president that's had pushback on most of his campaign promises over his first 100 days, not from Canada and Mexico, and who has had to walk back uh, from where he was. So I think that's part of the picture. All right, Althea, I want your view. But first, I want to show Justin Trudeau, because Trump uses the verbal threat. Trudeau uses the personal phone call, mm -hmm. trying to make a case. Here's what he says he said on that call. 
uh, I highlighted that, uh, quite frankly, uh, whether or not there was uh, a better deal to come, there were an awful lot of jobs, an awful lot of industries right now that have been developed under the NAFTA context. And a disruption like uh, cancelling NAFTA, uh, even if it theoretically eventually might lead to uh, better outcomes, um, uh, would cause a lot of short and medium term pain uh, for an awful lot of families. So was Canada running scared there for a few hours last night? Absolutely. I think they've been running scared since last week when uh, Donald Trump first said, you know, watch out. This is um, coming to the rescue of all the dairy farmers in the United States who can't export their products to Canada. Um, I think Canada's easy to pick on. Um, I think Trump has correctly identified that uh, Mr. Trudeau is not going to take a public stance against him, and that allows him to speak to his domestic audience. And I agree with Chantal. I think this is basically about negotiations, both with Canada, but mostly with Congress, who are, well, not just the Democrats who are refusing to uh, approve his trade representative, but the Republicans who are more focused on tax cuts and less focused on NAFTA. And Trump is basically saying, if you don't play ball with me, I am going to destroy what you say you care about, which is ensuring that the deal continues. And I don't think that Trump needed Justin Trudeau to tell him what the potential impacts of scrapping NAFTA would be in the United States. I think uh, agricultural producers and uh, congressmen were doing that for him. Um, but I think Canada as well, um, it, it puts us in, I think, a a difficult position. Basically, he's calling the nuclear option. You are either going to play ball with me on this thing that we've agreed to, or you know, I'm willing to walk from the table. And we saw well, him do that is, with Obamacare. Uh, but, yeah, it's but, uh, a high-stakes game. So, you know, who's, I, who's leading in this one? Who's winning or losing here, Chantal? But, but there is an upside in this for Canada. Uh, and, and it is that when the president allows to be floated the so-called nuclear options, the many constituencies in the U.S. that do have a stake in mm -hmm. NAFTA suddenly raise their yeah. heads and say, wait a minute. Uh, and Canada is not on its own, or Mexico, going to go to that negotiating table and preserve most of NAFTA. But there are strong U.S. interests yes. uh, that would be on side with Canada. And if Donald Trump wanted to give them a wake-up call, he did just that many yesterday. Many of them and in that's Republican the upside. states. And yes. We right. should say it's not entirely clear whether Trump can do this by himself, whether he can do it with other Congress. I've read scholarly legal opinions on both sides of that question, but it's certainly, at the very least, it's murky. Uh, so, he, you know, he may be calling his own bluff in a sense that, that it's not clear he can do this by himself. All right. I want to move to the Canadian story that happened yesterday and the fallout continuing a bit today with Kevin O'Leary dropping out of the race. Believability question on him is, does this make sense? This is why he says he quit. The, the real reason is I only got to 12 percent in Quebec. That's a fact. Now, you have to ask yourself, what is the likely outcome of only having maybe 11 or 12 seats or maybe less if I couldn't get support there. The truth about Canadian politics, and I don't have to tell you this, you people follow it, look at how many times Quebec has determined the federal outcome in elections in this country. It is the Florida of Canada. It often decides for the country for the very reason it has 78 ridings. You have to have some path to being successful there. The Florida of Canada. <laughs> you buy his argument, Chantal, as to why he dropped out? Uh, in part, yes, I do buy that uh, he dropped out because he suddenly discovered that he wasn't going to get the time of day in Quebec. But uh, I, I would uh, advance that clock to he wasn't going to get the time of day in Quebec to win the leadership. I've seen numbers, some of them from his own camp, which showed basically that uh, as you counted those ballots in May, he kept going down for lack of a capacity to attract second, third, fourth choices in Quebec. This is the second province in terms of way in that leadership vote. He was going nowhere here. I'm, I'm, I'm still puzzled as to how hard he even tried, whether it was in Quebec or elsewhere. He seemed to spend most of his time in the U.S. That's right. He I says mean, he's going to be supporting Maxime Bernier. It'll be interesting to watch over this next week how much time he's actually in Canada yeah. to do that. I mean, there were a lot of reasons why he was unlikely to win, but there were three big factors. One of them is certainly Quebec. He was never going to do very well in Quebec. It should have been obvious to him and his supporters right from the start. Secondly, he was unlikely to get many second choices. If you loved him, you loved him. If you hated him, you hated him. There was no very little in between. 
machine. So the only way to overcome those two rather large barriers was if he could swamp the leadership with all kinds of, like tens of thousands of new memberships. Mm -hmm. uh, m this having, you know, entered the race very, very late. Uh, and he failed to do that. Well, no kidding, he failed to do that. He barely ran in the campaign. He was only here half the time. He didn't go to half the debates. Uh, he had no real platform to speak of. I mean, the whole thing was fatuous. It was all rooted in notoriety, name recognition, his willingness to say rude things about people that in this present climate could get some types of voters excited. Uh, but that proved to be well short of the mark. And the people, as I say, the main chancers who kind of lined up behind him, took his, his dime, I think should look at themselves in the mirror. He's got the excuse of being a rookie at this with an ego as big as all outdoors. There were some people who should have known better who lined up behind him. Althea? Well, late last week we learned there were 259,000 conservative members and Mr. O'Leary had only signed up to 35,000. That is nowhere close enough to win uh, a, a race, even if it was just a one member, one vote, and it wasn't uh, weighted per riding, which is what this contest is. And it is very difficult to poll. I mean, they, they keep saying that they polled 8,000 people and that's where he gets this 12% number from. Um, I think he realized he couldn't win the leadership contest. If he did win the leadership contest, he likely was, unli was, he was unlikely to win the election. He has zero interest in being in the opposition benches. He seemed to actually not like the political process. Andrew rightly points out he didn't actually attend any of the official debates. He arrived in the contest right after the French debate, did not go to the Edmonton debate because he said he didn't like the format. When they changed the format to accommodate him uh, in Toronto, he bailed an hour and a half before the thing was to start. Um, I think there are lots of people who uh, rightly suspect his, you know, who doubt his intentions. He signed for a new season of Shark Tank. Um, you know, this is a guy who spent most of the time in the United States going on American TV, building his brand in the United States, making him you know, more valuable to them to be Mr. Canada. He did not spend all his time on the CBC or the CTV couches doing that here. No. People talk about flyover country. He treated the whole country as flyover country. This is a flyover campaign. It was like he was dropping leaflets from a passing jet, and this was going to be his campaign. He had very little organization on the ground. He had no roots in the party. Most of his policies were well to the left of, of where the Conservatives are. It was just bizarre so from the start. what was it all about, Chantel? Why did, why did he even get in? Uh, I'm guessing ego reasons uh, and some very poor advice from people who should have known better. It's amazing that uh, in this day and age, people who used to run Ontario or who spent a lot of time in the Prime Minister's office, in the case of Senator, former Senator Marjorie Le Breton, would make someone totally ignorant of the Canadian system with no deep thoughts as to how it functions, no knowledge of French, and would tell that person, yeah, go, you're, you're going to be a great fit for our party. A uh, great fit to what? Oblivion? I think they were looking for someone who could blow Justin Trudeau's uh, <laughs> out of the water. And they thought that Kevin O'Leary would have the media attention and could deliver uh, in 2019 in a way that none of the other candidates really frankly have, none of them have the public recognition that Mr. O'Leary has. And it did drive attention, it drove headlines, people wrote about the conservative race early on. I mean, how much ink was spilled about whether or not Mr. O'Leary was going to join the contest or whether he was going to be a kingmaker. Too much. <laughs> he even uh -huh. talked about joining the Liberals, yep. you know, so yeah, it's yeah. perplexing. All right, so where does it leave it? Is there like is is the endorsement of Maxime Bernier? Does that say okay, that's those thirty-five thousand votes will go to him? We know they don't. In these cases, they may not go to yeah. anybody. They may not even there vote. may be a lot of people who decide to stay home. I mean, when you even when you look at the Justin Trudeau supporters, uh, many of them did not actually vote in that contest. So who knows how many will vote? But even when you add up all the members that Mr. Bernier uh, has. Uh, signed up, let's say mm -hmm. 30,000 plus the 35,000, that's not 50% plus one. Um, I think it's a huge opportunity for the other candidates. Basically, the Andrew Shears and the Aaron O'Toole and even the Lisa Rates, uh, who, who have um, made perhaps more tenable possessions, positions, and even Mr. Bernie has, because he was a little bit more extreme than the others, so you to think drive and drive. I, I, absolutely. Andrew? I, I think this gives a, a, an added advantage to Bernier. It, sometimes when two companies merge, it's not so much the merger, mm -hmm. it's just that you're taking one of them out of the market. Yeah. Uh, and in this case, it makes him very clearly the front runner to the extent that anybody can guess at these things, because there's no good poll. But if you look at proxies like fundraising, et cetera, he's mm -hmm. well in front of the other candidates. And 
one of the things O'Leary said that I think is probably going to prove to be true is that some other candidates now are going to start to move and start to make deals. Again, you're absolutely right. They can't just commit all their supporters, right. but it will have some impact. Um, so, yeah, I think it makes uh, Bernier very much the front runner, but by no means over. All right. Chantel, you get the last word. I'm not convinced that you can make deals with people who are voting on their own, uh, alone with their ballots. This is not a delegated convention. I don't believe most uh, of the uh, O'Leary supporters were, will move en masse to Maxime Bernier. A lot of them will just not vote. But I do believe that it's a gift to Maxime Bernier. And as much as many of them are located outside Quebec, we know that he's very strong in Quebec. He's got strengths in other areas of the country. Every little bit helps. Uh, so I think that does give him an advantage. Uh, I'm not saying that he has it in the bag. I think that would be foolish. All right. We're going to leave it at that. We're less than a month away now from that vote. <laughs> Starting to feel really excited about it. Yay! <laughs> okay. All three of you will be there with us uh, on our coverage that weekend. Chantel's in Montreal, Andrew and Elthea here in Toronto. All right. Rex is next. This is Niagara Falls, and if you've noticed a little more foam at its base lately, perhaps it's mainly because of the beer. Beer that's being dumped by the caseload into the custom shed washroom upriver at Fort Erie. They are bringing more beer than usual on account of the uh, beer strike in Ontario. One Hamilton man who shuffled off to Buffalo to pick up a couple of six-packs got his comeuppance, but at least he, unlike many others, was able to kiss his beer goodbye. A Canadian beer drinking tradition is disappearing fast, and the first place they're feeling it is in the Maritimes. What's vanishing are those squat and stubby dark brown bottles. The Canadian brewery industry has spent millions of dollars to make the change to long neck bottles, and part of that cost is a result of scenes like this. There's no doubt that Cape Bretoners have done their part to support the brewery industry, and some wonder why the beer couldn't have found its way to a charitable cause. It's a beer drinker's lament. 700 cases of supposedly good brew down the drain, so to speak. Brewers say the change was inevitable. Light beer has become popular, and American beer and twist-off caps. I find when you're drinking out of it that uh, it foams up more. But most beer drinkers have adjusted. Oh, as long as the beer's still there. Specialty brewers are on the hop these days, rushing to cash in on more relaxed liquor laws. Now that Canadian liquor laws are changing, new breweries are springing up all over. There's one in the back of this pub in Kingston, Ontario. But the idea of drinking the stuff that's made in the back room is catching on. It's got a hell of a lot more body than Canadian beer, I'll tell you that. It's very smooth, it's very easy to drink. Okay, Ernie, if you could pitch your yeast there. Bernie Knudsen has been coming to this so-called U-Brew store for about three years. It's easy and it's cheap. Making your own beer and wine in British Columbia is virtually tax-free. You can brew a dozen bottles here for about $10. Buying it at the liquor store would cost $15. For the working men, yes, it's the working people, the working class people, it's a way better deal. Most hours have 60 minutes. This hour has seven days. Tonight, Ralph Nader charges the Detroit car companies with running risks that can't hurt them, but do hurt us. I could give an example of the Buick Roadmaster in 1953. The one with power brakes came onto the market, many thousands of them, with a defective braking system. Now... You mean in, in the 53 Buick Roadmaster, with power a driver brakes. would literally go from normal brakes to no brakes like that's that? Right, that's right. This is documented in court records which is very interesting. It shows you that the only way we find out about these things is through the cumbrous process of the judicial uh, uh, system. So what you want to do is make an overwhelming systematic case to overcome the resistance of industry. The stronger a case you make, the more scientists you have uh, working on the project uh, on an independent, objective basis, the more overpowering the forces of humane automotive technology will be.
Yesterday, the nation gathered around the altars of its widescreen TVs and wept. It was worse than the sinking in a Mariposa Bell with Anne Green Gables on board, a true national trauma. Canada's Mr. Wonderful has left the building. I suppose the big question now is, should we go ahead with the July 1st, 150 celebrations? Minus the golden dream of a Kevin Leary prime ministership, we must all face up to the bitter reality. Our country has no future. It's over, folks. Our only hope that some equal genius from the same rich pool, a draft, say, for one of the real housewives of Toronto, can fill this massive O'Learyless void. But that's a dim, really dim, it's hard to say how dim hope. How shall we miss him? Let me count the ways. First, of course, the great exorcism. He wasn't going to just defeat Trudeau and the Liberals in 2019, he was going to make him vanish. A few chants and a puff of smoke and the Liberals were going the way of the Gadarene swine, hurling themselves one by one from the Peace Tower with Bishop O'Leary, his Latin is stronger than his French, directing the operation from below. Then there was the famous spatula. This confused me at first. I thought it was a tribute to the short order cooks at the parliamentary restaurant. However, uh, it was Mr. O'Leary signaling he, quote, was going to scrape all that crap out of Ottawa. Not only have we lost a great leader, we've lost a brilliant plumber. And perhaps the most elegant orator since Pitt the Younger or Winston Churchill. Churchill had fight them on the beaches, but not even Churchill was going to follow them into the bathroom. The social justice movement will mourn his withdrawal. There goes the hope of our first amphibious prime minister. Up here he's a dragon, down there he's a shark. All scales for us and a razored fin for the Yanks. It was something to look forward to this, the Sharknado Godzilla administration. In sum, we are a lesser country today. The most talented individual ever to offer himself for public service, I'm going by his own press clippings, has performed a rush seppuku. He has fallen on his own spatula. It's not often we see such sacrifice. He is voluntarily stepping aside and opened the leadership of the Conservative Party to any one of 13 demonstrably inferior human beings. For as he made it clear yesterday, he had the leadership in the bag. It was Quebec in the election he worried about. The other nine provinces and the territories, the suburbs of Boston and the vineyards of Florida were his, but Quebec, well, Quebec had escaped enlightenment. So Mr. O'Leary graciously passed his good wishes on to Maxime Bernier, and Mr. Bernier very kindly accepted those good wishes. From the very man that Mr. Bernier only a short while ago called a bad candidate, a desperate loser, and a mud thrower. If the Conservatives aren't filming this, <laughs> the Liberals are, it's a real ratings grabber. For The National, I'm Rex Murphy. I'm Laura Lynch. Tomorrow on The Current, attorney Ken Feinberg, known as the Pay Czar, has dealt with compensation for some of the biggest acts of terror and disasters ever to face the U.S., including 9-11. Ken Feinberg on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. Tomorrow, Coca-Cola Company will tell a thirsty world it's putting a smoother, sweeter taste into the most instantly recognizable bottle in the world. This has got to be the boldest consumer product move of any kind, of any stripe, since Eve started to hand out apples. Here they drag out all the hoopla, thinking that they're going to war against the arch-rival Pepsi. But it turns out they've picked a fight in their own backyard with their best friends. I can't tell the difference between the new taste of Coke and the old taste of Pepsi. Why are you upset about it? My oldest daughter is 22. Her first word was Coke. Her second word was mommy. What? For decades, Coke has stayed on top by being cautious and conservative. Lately, though, Pepsi is growing faster than Coke. The Pepsi challenge is clearly hurting. Oh, we made our choice, make it a Pepsi. Pepsi has captured a, uh, a young, hip positioning that Coke, by nature of its corporate culture, is not really able to understand yet. I put a Pepsi in the bowl, service, but that's short enough to use. Hey, 
It must be every young boy's fantasy to turn around and see Michael Jackson. I mean, how wonderful. The Coca-Cola Company is bringing back the real thing. For weeks, the company has been hyping the taste of its new formula Coke. But today it announced it's going to start selling the old Coke again under a new name. We're bringing it back. The original taste of Coca-Cola returns as Coca-Cola Classic. We have booster ignition and liftoff. When the shuttle Challenger blasts off tomorrow, it will begin a new space race. On board will be two specially designed soft drink cans, one from Coke, the other from Pepsi, allowing astronauts to drink a carbonated beverage in the weightlessness of space for the first time. Yes. It's the Cola Wars in action. The supermarket shelf is the front line in the Cola War. Pepsi and Coke slugging it out in the world's longest running business battle. The National. The National. Tonight. amazing gesture is the icing on the cake. By no means is this the end. The curtain has not yet fallen. It's simply stuck. Sorry about that. Move it along. Yeah, there you go. When they slaughtered Congress, we didn't wake up. When they blamed terrorists and suspended the Constitution, we didn't wake up then either. Now I'm awake. For most Canadians, there's never been a time that Margaret Atwood wasn't synonymous with this country's literature. But all of a sudden, Atwood is everywhere, whether you're a kid, an avid reader, or just love a good TV series. Eli Glasner has the story. It's been quite the whirlwind for Margaret Atwood, walking the red carpet, promoting her new children's show, and shooting a cameo for an upcoming adaptation of Alias Grace. Hello. Pleasure, Eli Glasner. I'll be chatting with you. Will you? I will. Okay. Good luck with that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Things aligned in a way that had nothing to do with me planning them. <laughs> A big part of the new age of Atwood is The Handmaid's Tale, a new TV series based on her classic novel set in a world where women are turned into breeding stock. We only wanted to make the world better. Better. Lead actor Elizabeth Moss is getting raves for her performance, which was inspired by Atwood's novel. I read it over and over and over again and memorized passages, and it became uh, something that was very, very personal to me. Some say the series has taken on a prescient tone. The day after Trump was elected, Atwood references appeared at the Women's March on Washington. The handmaids have escaped from their book. Mm. <laughs> they have now become uh, those kinds of fictional characters that take on another life. So what I was writing as a, as a fiction back in 1984 or 5 uh, has now taken some giant steps closer to reality. There is any, uh, At this bookstore, they're having trouble keeping Atwood in stock. We had someone in yesterday who'd been to three different bookstores looking for a copy of Handmaid's Tale, and she picked up our last one. So Chris Sago is the manager. She follows her interest, and when she does that, her voice is authentic, and her, her thinking is sincere and profound and insightful. But when it comes to being seen as a prophet, Atwood is too busy working to worry, creating new novels, comic books, chatting on Twitter with her 1.5 million followers, and launching her new cartoon for word-hungry kids, Wandering Wenda. So where this is joined at the hip with The Handmaid's Tale is that in The Handmaid's Tale, women are forbidden to read, just as slaves were forbidden to read in the United States during slavery. 
Um, so Wenda is a reading enabler. <laughs> And where does all that drive to create come from? I didn't grow up in a world where people mm -hmm. were telling you not to do these things because they wouldn't imagine that you would do them anyway. But Atwood imagined a lot, and she's far from finished. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. That's The National this Thursday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching. Thank you.